Good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. It's another edition of Listen Up. I'm Drew Hopkins. Um, you know if you're tuned in to Listen Up, you're going to be talking to people that are influencers, game changers, or just really interesting people in the oil and gas business. Uh, today is no exception. We have one of my good friends and uh, somebody that's very well known in the oil and gas industry, uh, Mr. Jarris Johnson. Thank you. Um, Jarris and I go back to our Chesapeake days together, but then even after that, um, we've been on the same kind of speaking circuit sometime. Mm -hmm. um, there's just lots of, lots of collaboration, lots of different ways that you get to know each other through uh, speaking at different events, um, traveling around the nation. And uh, Jarris is definitely one of those people where um, after his kind of experience with uh, Chesapeake in Oklahoma City, um, he moved to Birmingham, Alabama, I did, yep. and he has continued to put as many miles on his Jeep as humanly possible to meet as many oil and gas companies and influential oil and gas people around the nation. So um, if there is an oil and gas company, Jarris has probably been in the lobby and been in a conference room at some point, and that's why he's here today. So just to start things off, Jarris, First off, glad you can be here in our garage. Thank you. Yes. It's beautiful. V very nice, uh, very Spacious. windy windy day today. Um, so we might get a little uh, backdraft from the garage doors, but you know, it's it's kind of, that, that's what gives us our little flair here. Um, if you want to give us kind of a little background of the history that we've kind of had together and sure. kind, of, kind of how, I mean, even like a step back from that, how'd you get into the oil and gas business? So uh, my background with oil and gas, so um, I grew up in Enid, mm -hmm. so 70, 80 miles north, northwest of here. Um, I grew up in a pretty blue collar family. Uh, my dad worked in the oil fields my whole life. Um, when I was a teenager, um, I was given the great honor of continuing in that family business. Um, three days after I turned 16, my dad woke me up in the morning and said, do you know where Chickasha is? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, you're gonna go on Van Buren, which in Enid is Highway 81. Right. Go south for two and a half hours and you'll hit Chickasha. There's some well sites there that I need you to mow. So I'm 16 and three days old, driving south, go through El Reno. Somebody runs a stop sign El Reno. I hit them. First day of First day on the job. First least. day on the job. First day driving on my own. I hit a car and it, it causes an accident. So Dad's I'm freaking excited. out. Yeah. yeah. So I'm freaking out, of course, by myself. And uh, police came and they all determined it was not my fault. Um, I pick up the bag phone. If you remember, remember those? Yeah. yeah, the bag phone. Not many people are going to remember the old <laughs> bag phone. Yeah. So I, I call my dad and, uh, and he immediately says, how's the truck? You know, and I, I said, well, the, the truck is fine. It's drivable. And he goes, okay, well, get this, make your statement, <laughs> get on down there. You know, you got work to do. Right. So um, that began my oil and gas career. So for that summer during, I was 16 and the summer of 17, I drove all over the state of Oklahoma, driving a truck, pulling a trailer with a tractor and a brush hog on it and, mowing. and was mowing well sites all over, all over Oklahoma. Um, so a few years later, I, uh, I, got out of high school. I did a couple of different things. And then, um, I was back in the oil fields working. Um, I don't mind manual labor, but I am a walking disaster. Like I am a safety hazard. I'm a total klutz. An OSHA violator. I am an OSHA. Right? Well, not intentionally. I'm just <laughs> stupid. You know what I mean? When it comes to manual labor, so I'm just an idiot. Like I don't, I caused so many accidents and problems during that short tenure. Um, it's, it's bad. Like it's dangerous. I'm mean, a hazard to myself and the people around me. Um, and that was never my intention anyways. Right. I mean, I, I was going to go on and, and be the first family or per, first person in my family to go to college. Um, cool. but I had no idea what to do because, uh, growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of exposure to different careers or professions. Like right. the only type of things that I knew about were what the kids were dressing up on for career day at grade school. You know, I knew doctor, I knew lawyer, I knew teacher, and that was about it. With with Enid, my grandparents were in Enid growing up, and I like I was in Ponca City, and we come over to Enid was the big city. Oh, I'm telling you, right? <laughs> was growing up there. Um, Continental was was growing, right? Yeah, Continental I mean, was still there during that time. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah, and that's what I was wondering. Of was that like a big influencing factor on? Did you see Continental and like its growth and like Herald and everything of what it was doing maybe for Enid? So um, my Continental connection actually came a little bit later, but I, I ended up did having one. Um, 
I, I didn't know what to do, and so I was always hoping that somebody would give me some direction and say, right. yes, this is what you would be good at, go do that. And um, I reached a point to where I needed to be making a pretty serious decision of where am I gonna go to school and what am I gonna study? And I had a friend whose dad was a geologist. He, he, um, he sat me down one day and he said, so what are you looking to do? And I said, I, I have no clue. Right. And he goes, well, you might make a good land man. Um, and OU has a great program for right. it. Why don't you go check it out? And I said, cool. And so I, I began trying to find out everything I could about Landman. I made an appointment, went down, I talked to the university and, and learned about the program and started meeting Landmen around Enid and around Oklahoma and was talking with them. And I thought, I still have no idea what you people do. You're not describing this very well, but yeah, I'll give it a whirl. Right. And I was a first year through college and um, I was actually a, a month into my internship with Continental Resources yeah. there in Enid okay. and began to understand, okay, this is what it is. And I liked it. And it's been a tremendous blessing for me and for my family ever since. So um, while I was in college, I did uh, courthouse work. I was doing title and leasing uh, for a brokerage that was down in Norman. Um, and then after graduation, I went out to Farmington, New Mexico. Okay. I was working with uh, Burlington Resources that was then bought by ConocoPhillips. And then shortly after that, I came to Oklahoma City. I went to Chesapeake. I was there for a couple of years. And then I left Chesapeake and I went to a small company called Quest Resource Corporation that became Post Rock Energy that should have a book written about it because it's one of the most amazing stories that nobody knows about in Oklahoma City oil and gas history. Interesting. Um, and then I went back to Chesapeake, which I know is a huge no-no, but but I did it. Um, actually, <laughs> I had to go do that orientation thing again. A second time? Yeah, super embarrassing. So I'm in there and uh, Aubrey is going around the room to get to meet people and he comes to me and he goes, don't you already? Familiar. Yeah, he said, don't you already work here? And I said, well, sure did. I, I did. And then I left, but I'm back now. And he goes, really? He said, people, people don't do that. People don't leave here and then come back. And I know what to say. Uh -huh. And so he finished the sentence for me and said, so what makes you so special? That's it. Yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one to answer. When he would put when he would put people on the hot seat, yeah. especially with anything like that, holy cow! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a, that's that's big being dropped in the middle of the room as fifty other people are looking at you, yeah. right, waiting yeah. for a response. That that was not my only run in with him where he made me feel that that small. But um, so so I was there for um, a few years um, and was there through all the transition and all the stuff that that happened um, after his departure. Um, and then, as you said, I went down to Birmingham, Alabama, of all places. Um, and I was with Energen for four years to the day when uh, their merger with Diamondback closed. And we've just enjoyed living in Alabama so much that we've just stayed down there. And thanks to the, uh, the wonderful innovation of remote working, I feel just as connected as I did before. And like you said, I get out on the road and I talk to whoever I need to talk to to stay relevant. and. I really enjoy all of it. It's good if, stuff. So the time that and so the time that we kind of met each other at Chesapeake and you know in like a leadership role in the land department. Mm -hmm. um, so as you're working through that, where at what point are you like? You know what? I feel like I understand this enough to where I want to start being able to like do these speaking events and yeah. being able to work with Ocaplita and Nadoa and Alta, yeah. all the rest of them, because those are the things that I think I think people would really recognize you from. Of like I've set in on the training classes that you've done, and for somebody that started off of mowing the well sites, <laughs> or and, and I mean I, I mean it in complete sincerity of the fact first person of your family to go to college and everything like that's that's awesome and then to be able to uh, see hey I, I like what I'm doing I love this I'm you know continuing to advance my career but I also want to help others um, that's what I really like mm -hmm. of being able to say hey you know I've, I've had a good career how can I give back and there's a lot of people even as oil and gas like the ebbs and flows of you know they're, they're hiring a ton of people for a while and then it kind of it kind of decreases but to be able to see like a new wave and like kind of we're, we're in like that mid range now mm -hmm. and there is a huge group 
that is younger that's coming on that I mean the classes that you've done I mean you've hit hundreds of people mm -hmm. uh, by now uh, what, what kind of made you want to start doing that I, I've always enjoyed the um, the public speaking thing um, I don't really have a problem getting in front of people and talking and um, you know, whatever happens, happens, I guess, right? Right. I mean, that's what we're doing here, right? Whatever happens, happens. Whatever this is. Whatever yes. this is. Yeah, <laughs> it just happens. Um, yeah, so side trivia fact about myself. I actually did a year of college on a theater scholarship. Yeah. yeah who knew? I like it. Right? The second half of this interview actually has us performing scenes from our favorite movies. So, Good. I mean, here in about five minutes, we'll okay. break it down. Well, I, don't I, know, will, I don't know how you I'll feel I'll talk about... fast okay. <laughs> so we can get to the fun stuff. I mean, you got shadow, but now I'm going to do really yeah. shadow stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, I was I was living in Birmingham. I was working in Birmingham with Energen, um, and I don't even know how my name came up. But Nalta was doing their annual meeting in Atlanta that year, and nice. so I think somebody went. Well, that's a company that's kind of close to Atlanta, and so you somebody can make a quick trip. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So somebody called me up and said, "Hey, um, is there anybody there who might be remotely interested in talking at our conference?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I'll do it." And um, so I think I had two different topics that I, that I addressed at that meeting. Um, one of them was about uh, oil and gas agreements, just mm -hmm. kind of a, um, a basic overview of oil and gas agreements. And another one was, was hitting um, a specific provision in the oil and gas lease. But one of the things that, that I've seen, um, you know, if there's kind of an, an overlying message I always try to project, um, but one of the things that I always end my presentations with is um, the belief that I have on the, the unified land department. Yeah. And, and far too often we see that segregation and that battle of who is superior. Is it land or land administration? And they're housed in different floors or different buildings A or lot of every times, areas. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's sad how little communication there can be sometimes. And so the purpose of my overview of oil and gas agreements discussion that I gave there was understanding that there's a lot of landmen who do their deal, they're so proud of their deal, they finish their deal, and they walk into a lease analyst's office with a pile of paper and say, here's the deal I did, put it in the system and walk out. Yeah. And they have no idea what it was. Like what it, the, the lease analyst doesn't know what this deal is. They don't know the context. They might know what the agreement was about or anything like that. And so what I wanted to do with that presentation is that for those that found themselves in that situation every now and then, give them some type of overview or context that they could rely on. So if you know Joe Landman comes in and says, hey, I just did this farm out of agreement with such and such company, they, they remember, they understand what those are and, and, and the value of what it means to the company right. and why what they're doing is so important for what it is. Have you seen <clears throat> in the uh, in, in meeting all the different oil and gas companies and kind of making your your cross country Jarris Johnson tour? Are you seeing a change in companies being able to integrate better with land and land admin and being able to, like are, are you seeing that still as a divide that needs to be worked on or are you seeing that people are actually kind of coming together? I'm seeing it happening definitely more now than it was happening at the beginning of my career. I, I feel like in like like this COVID era and, and everything that we've gone through, I, I feel like communication has really been cranked up to an 11. Mm -hmm. And where these different departments, whether they are smaller than they were before, or uh, just, just maybe trying to be more efficient throughout, mm -hmm. I feel like the reliance that they're having on each other um, is a lot more understood. Yeah. And where like a landman is, instead of dropping that file on somebody's desk, they understand what that land uh, analyst is doing or that yeah. lease analyst or, I mean, even to the point of where now we're seeing a lot more of like, you know, higher level managers in, in land departments um, and like even owner relations uh, people with real strong bonds because they know what each other are, are really working on and they know how important it is yeah. to the uh, other side of the equation. Yeah, I mean yesterday I, was, I had lunch with somebody in Tulsa and, and his career, he had been a landman mm -hmm. and he was, he's been recently put into a position where he's the land administration manager and, and uh, we immediately had something to talk about in that regard because he also wants to see that same thing happen where these groups are coming together and, and they're working uh, more in unison they're ha they're officing together you know when when and where appropriate in these days right um but 
they're working the same geographical area. They're getting to know these owners in the same way, and it's a much more collaborative environment. I think it's healthier and more fruitful for everybody that's involved with it as well. I think you're exactly right. <clears throat> now, one of the things that uh, that you and I've talked about before that I I think is an ever increasing issue. It's it's something that I see on LinkedIn a lot. It's something that I'm seeing uh, in the news all the time. Is how we're starting to integrate within this oil and gas world and the landman world is like wind and solar. Yeah. A lot of these people are uh, kind of going through those same those same uh, rotations of becoming a landman, but becoming a landman for those wind mm -hmm. things. What's what is your thought on the wind and the solar and how that's going to be kind of incorporated? Yeah, um, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a big, a big deal. Ball hanging yeah, out and I have to be careful, like what I say and how enthusiastic I get about it. Because right. if you act too enthusiastic about it, you're ostracized by people. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a very, there's some stalwart attitudes of, there's only one source of energy and only one source of energy that's viable and all others need to be right. put out to pasture. And I, I do believe that oil and gas, I do believe that those are the best fuels. I, no doubt, those Agreed. are the best fuels. But the reality is, is that there are people from a political world, there are people from an investment world who want to see these other energy sources developed. For sure. And if that's where the money is, if that's where if that's where people want to spend their capital, then yeah. as a service provider, I certainly don't want to only focus on one thing if there's people who want to give me money to help them be successful in other arenas. Right. You know, and I don't necessarily see that as a conflict of interest. I just see that as a good business practice. I, I think for uh, like like growing up in, in Enid, like yeah. we've got farmland not too far in Billings, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Oh yeah, there's all kinds of windmills there. Windmills all over the place. Right. And so we've got we've got some farmland there and uh, a landman for a wind company was talking to my dad and he said we need to we need to lease your land we'd like to put a couple of these different uh, 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 turbines on it right and my my dad is again oil and gas purist sure and he also doesn't want his his land to have anything on it you know losing any bit of farmland that he's got and he said no I I'm, I'm not really interested and I don't want to lose the view and I don't want to lose this and the guy was like I sympathize with that and he's like but it's similar to I feel like the way that the leasing was for oil and gas yeah. years ago he was like if you don't do it I'm gonna go across the street to your neighbor and if you don't like the view it's gonna have one right, right. Here that you're gonna see anyway um, I'm with you on the fact of I think the the oil and gas that has been such a huge part of my life for I mean this many years now and mm -hmm. like this is how we have we have had a wonderful career but I, I do think that we have to be very uh, to be very open to these new ideas that are happening because there's there's nothing that a person can say on LinkedIn or there's nothing that a article that can be written that's going to stop this right. sort of progress and right. so I think like you said there's a lot of investment firms that are that are really getting behind that strong and to be able to be knowledge about some knowledgeable about something I think that's the most important time we're in this this not transition of fuel but we're in this knowledge transition uh, period of where we have a really good opportunity to be able to learn about these different things and to be able to kind of absorb in as much as we want or as much as we can. So there's there's a lot to it and I think we're gonna see a lot more over the next few years, you know? Yeah, so a, a couple of observations on that, especially with people trying to transition their career. So um, 2020 was a very, very rough year for very many people in the oil and gas industry. Um, and it was a tough year for me. I mean, there was there was a bunch of different things that I was trying to see what could work or ideas that I wanted to continue to explore. Um, and part of that was I wanted to learn and understand what is this renewable business and yeah, what's happening. Sure. So um, I reached out to a bunch of different people who work in that space. And uh, and graciously, many of them took, took meetings and phone calls with me. And all of them, I mean, they had busy jobs but they had not a care in the world in terms of what was happening with the pandemic and everything else. I mean, they were not, they were not worried not about their job. Okay. They were not worried about their job going away. They were worried about getting all the work done that they had to do, Right. but they felt very secure and comfortable with where their future was headed. That's and uh, there's a lot to be said for that security, I yeah. think. Um, something else, you know, that I think is, that has happened, that I think is exciting that has happened is the AAPL has yeah, has recognized yeah. 
the um, that changing landscape of what type of energy work is available. Um, so in 2020, there was a, uh, a revision made to the definition of land work, and in 2021, um, it's being revised further to clarify some of the things that, that were intended from 2020. But um, the AAPL itself is recognizing now that anybody who works in these other energy sources, they're still landmen. Their experience that they have counts towards their education credits, towards their certification, towards their standing as an active member. Nice. Um, it's being recognized and, and embraced. Um, you know, I, I look at NAEP and I see NAEP as, a, as an oil and gas expo, but I don't know why it has to be only an oil and gas expo. Like, I don't know why we wouldn't energy. have, yeah, I mean, it's an energy expo. And if people have their renewable projects that they want to come and, and exhibit and potentially try to sell their prospects, I mean, what, a, what an outstanding venue for them to be able to do that. For sure, <clears throat> for sure. I, I, can see, uh, I can see there could be maybe some bully, bullying by the bathroom stalls or sure. something like that for, yeah. for the first couple of years. But yeah, I, I, think, I think everyone would grow to accept that pretty well, right? Yeah. I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, NAEP is such a, such a huge thing for, for energy and it's been the staple of oil and gas conventions for, I mean, years and years and mm -hmm. years. And I, I think that is kind of, kind of fitting of, of with how things continue to change of seeing AAPL recognize and to be able to see where this is going to go in the next few years. I, I, I would totally believe that that's going to happen. Do you think that the colleges like OU where they're doing these landman degrees is that already changing? Do you know if curriculum has changed at yeah, all? Yeah, so at the university level, I, I don't know. I don't know what's happening at the university level. Um, I would suspect that they're at least looking at it, but that's just a sheer guess. I do know that with AAPL, so now that the, the definition of land work has been expanded and we're counting those years of experience toward membership, well, naturally you want certifications to also yeah. match that. And so yeah, to be a CPL, it takes you know x number of years of experience and passing a pretty rigorous exam well i see that exam evolving to now also be covering what you need to know in these other energy sources sure. and if if the certification is going to cover that then the education also has to cover that as well so right. that landmen who are taking these exams are prepared for it so um i this year I'm the I'm the immediate past chair and last year I was the the first chairman of of the new education development committee that AAPL had and, and that was at the top of our agenda was introducing curriculum that would educate landmen on renewable energy sources I mean that was the highest demand that we were getting and that's what we were persevering to, to try and offer that's unbelievable. That, it's going to be a topic for years to come, and it's going to be so fun to see how all, all of this evolves. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I think there's a lot of heartache for for some people, but I think it's it's an opportunity of being able to learn new things, being able to find find new ways that we can be effective mm -hmm. on uh, training, on being able to offer. You know, I, I, there's there's a lot of opportunity there for sure. Indeed. Um, kind of switching bases just a little bit, or, okay. or switching this up. Um, when, when we've been in leadership roles and uh, when we've worked at Chesapeake and, and as like you're kind of forming a career and kind of forming you as a personality, what were some, like one of the things that I always like to cover on this uh, video cast is saying, what were influential leaders in your career that you might have modeled yourself on? Have, have you had anybody that really made an impact that you, you wanted to mirror or kind of carry on like some sort of a legacy. And don't say me because we work next to each other. <laughs> now I'm gonna have to think about it. Is video, is it, is that, by the way, is that, what is this I called? Don't know. Is it I, a video, video cast? cast? I don't know. Is I it just... a podcast? Because I was trying to tell people, hey, I'm gonna go do this thing. We're... I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go do a podcast with Drew. We're and, like, and they're like, oh, I, I wanna listen to that. We're like eight well, episodes in and yeah. I have no clue what I'm doing. Well, well, you can't listen to it. You have to watch it on YouTube. So, well, I mean, what does that become? Is well, it a video cast? I'll tell you, like as as I'm getting older and my features are getting like way worse. Yeah. Like the whole idea of even doing like a video cast is just asinine. <laughs> and like I can't believe I'd even like subject myself to this, but Barrett tells me it's the only thing we can do, so like who am I to argue at this point, right? Right. I mean 
radio DJs are people who are too ugly to be actors on screen. That's right? what I need. And so that, that's, we just need to be speaking into yeah, this exactly. mic. Yeah, exactly. Like, like I don't, I don't see myself as somebody who's pretty enough to be on. Oh, camera. we can save all the money on the set. I don't even I need a light here. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was stalling to try and think about, <laughs> think about your question. So uh, influential people, right? So um, it, this is going to sound really cliche, um, but I mentioned at the beginning that my dad, you know, was was works in the oil field. I mean, continue to this day. He's Always still, love it. He's an independent guy, and, and he, I mean, he he does he does the work that nobody else wants to do. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, but he's got this one ton truck and it's loaded with a welder and all kinds of pipe tools and, um, you know, a, a, a winch and I mean, he can do whatever. And then he pulls his backo around everywhere. And I mean, if he was in his backo and I had an itch on my nose, I would completely it. trust him to scratch my nose with that bucket. I mean, he's- Those he's, guys are artists. He is that good with I mean, it. those guys I mean, are it's, artists. It's awesome. But his, his overall work ethic and determination to see a job, take on any job, and yeah. do it the absolute best that he can do it is something that rubbed off on me subconsciously at a young age and now as i'm becoming older and, and wiser right. i'm i'm consciously recognizing what a huge impact that that's has had um so awesome. that's been huge and then i i had a my first time i was a land manager it was it was at a uh, it was a at a smaller company and i had a vp of land and he and i worked together for it was about a year um and he has been through the business for decades and has accomplished so much stuff um, his name is dave pinson and um he was like he has been that quiet mentor at the top of my mind that i don't know that he ever realized what a mentor he was but there was just so many incredible life lessons and management lessons and oil field lessons and everything that he just spewed out constantly just by living like he didn't have to say anything you just you just watch the guy and you're just That's in awesome. awe over how he does. I mean, he, he had a he had a spotless desk all the time and he wanted to take care of people's problems, but he wanted to help them take care of their problems, not take care of the problems nice. for them. And so, you know, people would walk in there and they got their file and they'd march in and sit down and, and he'd say, what can I do for you? And they'd put that file on the desk and they'd say, well, I've got this issue that I'm trying to work on. And he'd go, hmm, well, what do you think you're going to do about it? And push it right back across the chair. And they said, well, I'm thinking I'll do this, this, and this. And he goes, that sounds like a great course of action. <laughs> you know, see it through. Let me know if you have any problems. And they'd march out, you know, not really realizing why they still had the file in their hand. Because <laughs> right. they thought, trying to pass the yeah, buck. They thought their boss was going to solve it for him. And, and he... He empowered people to be able to learn on their own, but he was always there to catch somebody if they fell. That's, you know, perfect message right there. Yeah. That's awesome. and, and another thing he did, which, you know, showed me that nobody is like beyond any one task. Right. So right. he was he was the VP of land. He came in as an executive in this company and and uh, we were having some type of bad rapport with all of our landowners that we interacted with. And nobody knew why. Right. We just kept hearing from the field. All the landowners are really mad at us right now. Well, why? Well, they just are, you know? And so he sent out a company edict and he said, I want all landowner calls that ever come into the company to come to me. Yeah. BP of land, this is the job he wants. And for about two or three weeks, his phone rang and he just took and he answered every single call. What's your problem? Tell me about it. And after about two weeks, he was getting, you know, a few calls a day. After about another week, maybe one call a day. And then after about another week, they just trickled out. And, and all it was is they just needed somebody to talk to. And there was some type of breakdown in communication in the company. And he recognized that. And even though he could have pawned that job on the secretary or anybody to be able to handle that, he wanted to know what that problem was. And he wanted to be able to come up with a solution. And he, awesome. he, Took himself to whatever level it took to be able to do that, and I, that's I, I I I try to give him credit for these things whenever I have a chance to, and and I don't know if he believes how sincere I am when I tell him what a role model he was. Today. That's I, I mean <clears throat> if 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 he gets the chance to watch something like this, whatever this is again, whatever it is, but it, like that is the type of leadership, and that is the type of of I, I think that is what drives good companies to be great. Oh yeah, that is what it, like. 
builds departments, builds people, and it builds like like you and others that see someone that does something like that. Yeah. It sticks with you and then it builds you. And like it, it's, it's such a great thing to be able to have uh, companies that people will really, I will wear any hat as long as it you know, builds on the success of, mm -hmm. of what we're going for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really, I really do like that. And I mean, it, it sounds like between your dad and the different people that you've ran in, you know, ran into, uh, that's, that is the making of a really strong and, and fun and, you know, meaningful career for sure. Yeah. Um, so now you are doing, is it VP of innovation? Is that what I just saw? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about how this came to be. So after, as I mentioned, after Energen, um, I stayed in Birmingham and um, I, I don't know how shocking this is to most people, but there are not a lot of oil and gas companies in Birmingham, oh Alabama. Alabama. Yeah. So I decided to form what immediately became the largest energy company <laughs> in Birmingham. <laughs> so put that on that's yeah, right front yeah. page of I the know, newspaper yeah. i now own the we're place. here yeah. you know yeah <laughs> um so I, I i've always had kind of an itch to see what i could do um from an entrepreneurial spirit or frame of mind um and this was going to be the best time to do it so the beginning of 2019 um i was giddy and happy and i had all kinds of ideas in my mind um and it took me longer than it should have but i found out a lot of them were not good ideas or they were not viable you gotta go through them um but in the interim um people approached me and asked me if i would help them on a consulting basis. And um, I really, really enjoyed the aspect of helping people, like way more than I ever thought I would. And so ha being able to offer a skill set or a knowledge base to somebody that genuinely helps them really made me feel good about, you know, offering something. Um, I, I change the wording a little bit every time, but I, I, for me, I've realized that I get my greatest sense of fulfillment when I help others achieve their goals. Um, and so that's what I felt like I was doing. Um, and I felt like that there were a lot of things that have traditionally gone on in land departments for a long time that um, it's time to change. It's time to change how we approach different tasks and how we do things. And so I began trying to communicate that message out as I was, as I was building what this consulting business was going to be. So I came across um, the guys at, at Paramount up in Tulsa and uh, we were able to meet and talk and found out that we had very very similar visions lined up nice. in terms of what we thought would be accomplished from a service standpoint to offer to land departments um they had a stellar reputation and infrastructure that they had been building for over a decade um i had some in-house skills and experience that i felt like i could contribute and we felt like that if we were able to combine our forces and our energy together that we could accelerate our plans greatly. Um, and so we, we've talked about things off and on for, for a while and, and we've engaged on some projects from time to time. Um, and I, I mean, I, I've had the, the thought that I want to be part of building something. Yeah. Now, whether that be, I create something from the ground up and it's my own name and I build it up, that feels great, you know? But if I'm also able to go into an organization and help them achieve the next level and yeah. have some part of it that I feel like is is mine that I've been able to, to help build as well. To me, that's gonna be just as rewarding. And so that's that's what this opportunity has been. It's a chance for me to be able to um, have a key role within the Paramount organization and, and uh, the title that we felt would that would be well suited for what we're trying to accomplish is trying to help groups innovate and mm -hmm. and revamp the way that they do things for the better and so that's that's kind of where that vp of innovation title came from i think it's but. fitting i think it's very fitting and i mean <clears throat> exactly what you're saying of being able to go in and help like kind of show your skill set and all the things that you've been able to implement in different companies um, it's it's a great yeah. way to do it and it, it is a fulfilling feeling whenever you get to see the hard work that you've put in pay off for other people of being able to say this is the way that i do it um, these are these are the little uh, little things I'd change that would make a huge difference. Yeah. It's very very uh, fulfilling. It's a great work. Well, the the Sussmans, Blake, Chad, Emily, they, they have great reputations. They've been doing these for for a long time now. Um, Blake possesses 
organizational vision that is far beyond my capacity. Like I have things in my head that I that I think I can somewhat articulate out loud. If I have to put that on paper in like a cool diagram not or choice. something, it, it's not me. <laughs> but Blake, he he grabs all that stuff and he he really absorbs leadership training things. He's always seeking self improvement on. I mean, today he was telling me about different coaches he has for different things, and it's just it's incredible. And like being able to to take that mind with whatever it is what, that I have or bring to the table, uh, we, you know, we're really excited about some cool things on the horizon. Man, I, I, can, I can see a lot of similarities, like even our, our team here um, at LIS, we all have different, like we've got Jim, who's really like good with data and being able to like, just like what you're saying, of he is just a sponge with all of this and he can put it all in practice, Amy, like can do the same thing for <clears throat> outsourcing. Wade is just one of the, is one of the absolute most brilliant oil and gas people that I've ever met in my life. And then much like what you said, I'm like, where do I fit in? Yeah. Like, uh, innovation works and yeah. uh, let me get the word out. And so apparently I'm good enough to be on camera. So maybe that's what I do. I don't know. You are, well, you've got a, you've got a story to tell. Um, you are you're passionate about what you do. You've made a huge impact, and just the the short time that we were able to work, you know, fairly closely together, like not right next to each other, right. but in the same vein. Um, like I picked up on that, and like I saw like how much you cared about your work, cared about doing it right, and. I think whenever you look at how many people we had at Chesapeake for so long, the one thing that I, I am continuously happy about is I really feel like um, there was a genuine effort to hire people that were like the go-getters, yeah. um, the ones that were going to move the needle going forward. And I, I would 100% say that you're one of those people and um, it's fun to see that person um, we see those in Denver, we see those in Midland, we mm -hmm. see those every one of these areas of not just Chesapeake people, but really the people that have taken that same mindset of I'm going to hit the ground, run with it, um, and find the team that is going to make the most sense. Yeah. And whenever you find that combination, I mean, you can do absolutely incredible things. Anytime I've, I've left a job, I've never felt like that I was running away from it. Yep. I felt like that there was an opportunity that was ahead of me that I just felt like I needed to take advantage of. And the hardest part of leaving any job has been leaving the people behind. Yeah, I mean, it's, truth, it, it? it really is. And, it and is. If, if that's, you know, if that is what makes that decision so hard and that transition so hard is leaving the team behind that you were with, then that's some, that's just something special about the work environment that you were, at, you were in. And thankfully that was, I mean, that's something I've been able to really enjoy my full career. Well, I, I'm I'm happy that uh, that we crossed paths in our career. Like it, it was a richer experience for it, for sure. And just kind of as we wrap this up today, um, I, I guess like just a what is something? This has been 2020 and the start of 2021. It, without ad nauseum talking about how things have been rough, we've yeah. seen a lot of things. What is kind of a message of hope or what, what are you looking forward to in the next six months, year, two years? What's what's the thing that you're looking forward to the most of seeing the business kind of get back at the wheels under it again? Yeah, great question. Um, thanks for that opportunity to, to rattle off now for the next half hour, you know, because <laughs> <Right. laughs> we're running out of VHS. No, I get really excited about about what the future can can possibly hold. So, um, you know, one of the first questions you asked me was was getting started on like the speaking and and um, the the message that is that is being delivered in, in upcoming speaking presentations is kind of really that message of of hope. I mean, it, it's not built that way, but when right. you look at what the content is and what the message is and what we're encouraging people to do, it, it brings hope to to what their their jobs are. So. Um, last year, I, I did a couple of, of uh, webinars for Nalta and also for Nindoa, um, and it was called Land Apartments in the New Normal. And what does, what has 2020 and everything that it brought, how has it ch ch brought changes to land apartments and why are some of those changes actually good? Yeah. Um, and, and so that message has evolved and um, as I mentioned, Blake's awesome mind of how he's able to organize so much stuff. Um, I, I had a couple of other invitations for this coming year and, and asked him to partner with me on those. And so um, we've created what we're calling the Evolver Die series. 
Cool. Um, so we have, uh, we've got the HAPL webcast coming up next month, which is they broadcast out to like all the local associations. And it's one of my favorite education events. I'm very honored, very excited, very humbled that, to be doing that one. Cause I've always held that, that event on That's such a cool. high bar. Um, we'll be doing the AAPL annual meeting in the summer. We'll be doing OCAPL in September. Um, and I think we're gonna be doing the NALTA annual conference in September as well. So these are what we have so far. Um, and as invitations come in where I like, I grab onto every one of them and tell, oh, Blake, oh, by the way, we're also doing this one. Cause I, I just get so excited about it. But the whole message of, of Evolve or Die is um, that land departments have followed a structure and it's been a very similar structure for a long time. Yeah. Um, I went to college at OU. I did the energy management degree. Um, but when I came out of college, I was not ready to be a landman from day one. You know, it, you can't teach how to be a landman or how to be a division order analyst or how to be a lease analyst. You can't teach that in school to where somebody graduates and they exit the classroom and they're like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm ready yeah, to do everything that, that there is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to learn it from somebody. Yeah. And chances are the per who we're learning that from learned it from somebody else. And who learned it from somebody else? Who learned it from somebody else? And so we've developed these very entrenched traditions and culture as to how we're doing things. And we're in a season to where maybe we can shake that up a little bit. That's great. And so um, that's, a, that's a message that we're trying to, to deliver to people. One is, um, and this is another like renewables this is kind of another point that is somewhat controversial but it's one that i think is going to happen um the cycles of oil prices going up and down and staffing following going up and down as well those cycles are contracting and it's so expensive for a company to hire somebody and then to lay them off a couple years later oh yeah the training and everything that goes into that like like i've seen the stats on it of how much it costs yeah it's it's, it's unbelievable so on average it's over four thousand dollars to hire somebody that is just hiring them that that doesn't include any type of recruiting fees um that's just the onboarding process and initial training is four grand a person and then a person's total compensation, only 70% of it consists of salary and wages. The remaining 30% is benefits and other perks and everything. Um, if somebody is, is caught in a reduction in force, more than likely they're gonna get some type of severance payment, right? So those, these costs are huge. And to do these cycles every couple of years, I just don't think it's sustainable. And so the premise that when I began this journey to be working independently and to be offering services to people, the premise that I believed is that this is probably going to be the last major downturn where companies are willing to follow that cycle. And what I believe is going to happen is companies have their core staffs today and they will continue with those staffs no matter what type of activity happens. Mm -hmm. And they'll supplement the rest of what they need with contractors, consultants and technology. And so that's our message that's what we're trying to help people be prepared for that's what we're trying to open some eyes and, and some minds on is being willing to accept that now um for why does that give hope you know one from the company standpoint it gives hope because they have options and solutions that help their company remain viable that protect their gna budget line that help them streamline and achieve things that they didn't think were possible before um, it gives hope to those individuals who are caught up in these unfortunate events because a, ma a person who's had a career as an in-house landman doesn't have to wait for a company to go hire them again. Yeah. There's going to be avenues for them to apply their skills and knowledge and go work for a multitude of companies potentially simultaneously and offer their services and offer their skills to these organizations. So we're moving into a new era of how land work is being done. I say land because that's what I know, but realistically, I don't know why this wouldn't apply to all disciplines in oil and gas. Um, and so if you've got the right attitude of, yes, things are changing and I'm okay with that, then I think there is reason to be hopeful because whether the periods are up and down, there ought to be places for just about anybody to be able to be involved. I agree, I definitely agree. Well. I think that's a good place to end and I, I think a message of hope and just a very exciting future uh, for, for all of us in the energy industry. 
Uh, Jarris Johnson, sounds like you will be around. If people are looking to, to see you in an event, it sounds like they're gonna have the opportunity, right? Yes, and if you're not able to see me in an event, I love being on LinkedIn. So find, sure. me, find me on LinkedIn and chat, message, and everything else. For sure, so <clears throat> another episode of Listen Up. We appreciate you watching, take care.